All right, good afternoon. Uh, you guys are you're really committed to being developers if you're showing up at the last day, last session. This was only added a couple days ago to this track schedule, so I, I'm actually really pleased to see this many people here. Um, my name is Tyler Jewell. I am a founder and CEO of a company I run called Code Envy, but I'm more importantly a project lead for an open source project called Eclipse Che. Eclipse Che is a next generation platform uh, for the Eclipse Foundation um, as a type of IDE. Um, let's just get out on the table, the elephant in the room, this scar on my face that everybody was asking. Apparently, like all the week long, people were talking more about my scar than the presentation in the keynote. Um, I got it. Uh, this, is what, this is a story I'm telling anyways, in that uh, I got it on my 40th birthday, which was Monday of this week. Here, I turned 40, the second half of my life. And, you know, I just wanted to do something youthful, and my neighbor was irritating me, so I challenged him to a samurai sword fight. It wasn't a clean kill, right? That's a good story. Um, you know, the truthful story was middle of the night, get up, walk right into the wall, <laughs> full speed, <laughs> covered in blood everywhere. I was yelling at my wife, get the camera, get the camera, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. <laughs> we got to record this, right? <laughs> Otherwise, people, people won't believe it. Um, but uh, uh, turning 40 is a very interesting uh, development for me, uh, you know, midlife, right? And for, for the most part, Programming and development is, uh, for, for right or wrong, is thought of as a young man's or a young woman's sport. Uh, you have, it's a very, a lot of youthful energy that goes into development. Uh, this perception that you have marathon sessions and that it requires stamina and energy. And it's something that you do when you're very young. Now myself, uh, I got a degree in computer science. I thought I was going to be the world's best programmer. Uh, graduated in the 90s got a job, uh, and turned out it wasn't a very good programmer. Didn't like it that much. Uh, went into evangelism instead. And uh, joined BEA in the 90s and spent a very long time at BEA and wrote books on Java, traveled around the world, did lots of presentations for them, and I got to work as an architect on a variety of different projects. And I loved it because it was empowering and it made me uh, feel very knowledgeable and informed. I then proceeded to desire money. So what do you do when you're an engineer and you desire money? You go into management, you know, product management, climb the corporate ladder. And in 2010, I got super sick. Uh, I got ill, and uh, I was out of commission for nine months, you know, offline. And when I finally healed myself, I sat there and go, you know, what am I doing? I miss this technology skills that I had. I really miss them, uh, honestly. And I'm like, I need to get out of management absolutely out of management, this is just not the place to be, and I sit down with the Eclipse IDE at the time, uh, and I'm going to do the Pet Store app, I'm going to do Maven, I'm going to do Tomcat, everything very popular, common configurations, and three days later, I couldn't get the damn shit to compile. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, I am frustrated, I am irritated and I'm humiliated as well. How can someone who had all these skills, you know, who felt this empowered, just go eight years beyond and suddenly can't get anything to work? And, and I'm sitting here going, like, I'm trained. I should know how to do this. Can you imagine all the people who don't have these skills? Children, you know, adults, right? Whomever it is. And, and one of the things that is very important to me is that technology should always be approachable. I mean, because that's what's exciting. It's enthusiasm. It's excitement with that. And, and it was in that frustration where I'm sitting here like, I don't want to be a manager anymore. I want to reacquire my technical skills. And, and this utter irritation that I have. And it's just this very simple idea. You know, this stuff should just always work. You should be able to click a link. And then on that link, everything shows up that you need in order to build your project. And, and of course, you know, like, you know, um, in, in this kind of silly way uh, that, that things happen, that was the idea for Code Envy, which was we are going to build a company and we're going to make it possible for people to click a link and inside that link is going to be a workspace that has everything that they need. And next thing you know, I'm C founder and CEO, which, you know, management position, here we go again, right, on this whole thing, and off to the races that we go. Um, so... Uh, 
let's talk about this idea. Very simple idea. Anybody anywhere should be able to contribute to a software project without contributing any software. And I want to talk about that and how that led to Eclipse Che. And then Samsung was generous enough to work with us on Eclipse Che to build this Samsung Arctic IDE. And I'm going to talk about how we use that to build the IDE and then actually use that to program these devices here. Um, so first, what's a contribution? There are three things. You need your IDE, you need your project files, and you need your runtime. Now, in this case, a runtime for a workspace is anything that you need to operate against the files. So whenever you do a compilation, analysis, a debugging, that is an activity. It requires a process. That process needs to do something against the files. Now, you need that runtime to exist. You need those software to be there. Now, in desktop IDEs, the traditional interface is that the workspace is a personal unit of work. It encompasses your project files, and then it integrates with the IDE in the runtime. Now, your traditional runtime is localhost, right? We install the IDE on our computer. Localhost is here. I get a workspace, but all that runtime component are localhost runtime. The issue with that is localhost is not scalable. It's not migratable, right? It's pinned to this machine. So if you want to allow someone to um, have a workspace on demand, it's virtually impossible to do that if your local host, uh, if your local host, or if your workspace on your desktop is using localhost. So there's all sorts of limitations that come with that. So Eclipse Che is an effort to make workspaces universal. And in order to do that, what we did at a very simple level is redefine the abstraction of a workspace. So if previously it was this abstraction, now a workspace includes not just the project files, but it also includes the IDE and its runtime. So that when the workspace is generated, it has everything that is needed for the developer to develop right away. So what do we mean by that? So the first thing is, is that in Che, workspaces bring their own runtimes. So when you create a workspace, we're actually booting up a runtime inside. Now we're using Docker for this. You can have one runtime or many runtimes. The next thing is, is your projects, which is your source code, are mounted into the runtimes itself. So they're mounted onto that, so they're married together. And then every workspace serves up its own unique browser IDE. The IDE is inside of the workspace itself. And then that way, anybody with a browser can, who can get access to the workspace will have access to the IDE. And then SSH is in all, all these workspaces as well so that the desktop IDEs can link into it. We then take these workspaces, and Che itself is a server. It's a workspace server, and you can host up multiple workspaces, which then allows you to share them with multiple users, right? It's browser accessible. It can be a shared entity in that regard. And because of the way that they're constructed, these workspaces have strict recipes and stacks, which allows us to dehydrate them for storage and then rehydrate them in any other location. We can actually move a workspace from machine to machine, from machine to cloud, cloud to cloud, and it will have identical state as when it was running before, including the tools that were inside of it, such as the debugger, the compiler, uh, the state of the projects that were inside of it. We can rehydrate them where we need to do that. And then, on top of that, because it wouldn't be an Eclipse project if it was just a solution on its own, all of this stuff is extensible, customizable, and programmable. Each workspace ships its own RESTful API so that you can actually link to the workspace um, and program the workspace itself. And the Chase server has its own REST API so that you can create workspaces, destroy them, all programmatically, whether it's local or remote on the end. Um, one natural benefit of this, you know, a lot of people were very, you know, like, initially alarmed at you know, programming through your browser. But one interesting benefit of this is that because it's just a server product, you can embed this in Che workspaces in any place that you can run servers. Um, so one place that we run it is actually on the Arctic device itself. Right? And so when you have an, a, a server that can uh, host workspaces that serve up a browser-based IDE, you can provide IDE experiences inside of any other product out there. So you plug the product in, get the IP address, 
put the IP address into your browser, and voila, you've got an IDE on demand without the developer having to set up anything to go along with it. So there's a lot of potential with this. So I'm going to give you this great demo about Che itself, and then we'll do the Arctic IDE. But the Arctic IDE is a custom Eclipse Che assembly. And assembly of Eclipse Che is a combination of the core platform with custom plugins, custom branding, uh, custom stacks, templates, and an installer. And then what we've done with it is we've added device discovery so that we can discover this device that's connected to this network here. Um, we then have SSH connectivity and management so that from um, the workspace we can connect to the device and have a um, interface there. We inject a web terminal so that we can get multiple bash uh, shells going. We've got a GDB debugger and we also do some work with the Arc SDKs and runtimes. All right. So with that, let's uh, Elmo it or demo it, um, whatever, the, whatever that keyword was, that secret phrase. Um, sorry, a, a demo. Now I understand what Elmo meant. That's Elmo. I thought it meant, you know. Lucy. Uh, this computer here. Um. I am. I'm duplicating. Yeah, well, it was working. I verify. Hmm. Can you play on another thing? I'll get you. I'll try to work on this. Uh oh, we're having momentary technical difficulties. Voila. Magic. I'll tell you what. If we can figure out projection technology and the DMV, we're going to be rich. Those two, those two problems. Solve those two problems, and you are going to be rich. OK. All right. So uh, I'm going to do a, a Java project to, to get started with as a, um, uh, uh, to show just Che in general, and then we'll get to the Arctic IDE. Um, so we're going to create a workspace, and uh, when you create a workspace traditionally, you just typically pick your software uh, code repository, and you pick your project type. Um, in this case, because every workspace has at least one runtime, you also need to pick your runtime. And the runtime is the stack of software that you want to have installed inside the workspace in order for the project to do what it's going to do. Now in this case, it's a Java project. So, uh, and we're going to do a Tomcat Spring based application, and it's going to require Maven. It's going to require uh, a secure shell daemon in there. We're going to want Tomcat installed. I think it's Tomcat 8 that we need to have installed, and a, uh, a Spring Pet Clinic application as well. So, I I'm going to choose a, a blank project that we do. Is that, I mean, is that better? Is that zoom good? Okay, good, great. Um, I, could, I could import from Git or GitHub or Subversion if I wanted to, but I'm going to take from a blank one. And uh, we have this uh, stack library here. And you know, the stacks tell us uh, essentially what is going to be installed in that. And, and this is just a fancy representation of a Docker file. So we use Docker containers to be the runtime for the workspaces. And what this says is that we're going to do a JDK 8 from Oracle. Um, it's going to install Maven 3.2. Uh, it's going to get Tomcat 8. And I can show you what these Docker files look like. If we didn't want to do that, we could uh, write a custom stack here uh, where we could provide our own Docker file. Um, we could import another one. Um, lots, of, lots of options that are here. Uh, but once I've chosen Java, then you know, we've got the workspace with its runtime. We need to give it um, some space. 
uh, you know, so give it some RAM here. Uh, that's going to be the size of the container. And then I want to do the Java Web Spring project, and I'm going to go ahead and build that. Now, when I say create this project, um, it goes off and actually creates the workspace. And in order to do that, it will create a Docker container for that with the two and a half gigabytes of RAM. If that Docker file has not been built, it will build it and create an image out of that. If it's referencing an image that's at Docker Hub, it will download that image from Docker Hub as well. And this can work behind a proxy if you need to do that. Um, and so the first time, it, it can take a little while. And I'm going to skip that step because I've already um, opened up a workspace here. And after that workspace is booted, then you just you know, uh, say it'll give you open the IDE, and voila, the IDE opens. And, and here we are. You can see that I'm in a browser. I'm running a, a server on this IP address. It's 192.168.28.28. Uh, um, you can see that I'm in a browser because I can just shrink it and, um, and enlarge it at the same time. Uh, nice browser. Uh, professionally designed. Um, uh, like the force, you know, IDEs need to be in balance, so we have a, a light theme to go with the dark theme as well, so that the force is always in balance here. Um, we've got a, a very nice editor. Uh, it's an Orion-based editor, which gives us all sorts of functionality. We've got the little uh, navigator over here. You can do different tab indentations. Uh, there's syntax analysis for about 150 languages here. Um, when I opened this up, it detected it as a Maven project. Uh, you can see that it's got the Maven Palm here, and as part of that, it automatically downloaded all my Maven dependencies. It saw that, it analyzed the dependency list, automatically downloaded them, and, and that's absolutely wonderful, because once those dependencies are downloaded, I can start doing things like um, autocomplete and content assist. And so in this case, uh, that was pretty fast, and you'll find that actually the performance is just as fast as anything that would be on your regular machine, and I can explain why that's the case. But it's context sensitive. So here I'm in the class, and it gives me class level IntelliSense. I can come up to the import statements here. Um, you do control again, and now I get uh, uh, import level, package level um, IntelliSense. Here is autocomplete for the packages, which is nice. Uh, I'll do a, go away, and it's going to give me a warning message here. Oh, I never used this import. Well, that's not very good. And so I'll just hit all to enter, and um, I can remove that unused import. Oops, didn't type it very well. There we go, remove it, all good. And uh, so lots of IntelliSense capabilities. Uh, and this IntelliSense goes pretty far. Uh, for example, I can come, where's my class? Went to the class here. We'll go create a new Java class, call it my class. We'll just do public void my, my method, write some Java code, return Samsung developer conference. Dan is my friend. Don't forget the semicolon. And, you know, it gives me some, uh, it gets rid of the syntax errors there. I haven't saved anything. It automatically does it here. And now in this class here, I may want to use it. You can see result hello plus username. Um, and let's just do a, first of all, let's instantiate my class. And let's add some syntax errors here. So oh, try drawing my class. It already knows that it's there. And and if I do a plus mc dot, uh, thank you, yep. And there's my method already in my autocomplete. And because it's so zoomed in, it's redrawing kind of weirdly. So there we go, um, and we changed right in some code. Uh, so IntelliSense, uh, and it worked fast. It was, I was typing as fast as I could, and it was keeping up with me. Now, I can do this in the cloud because that what we're doing architecturally is the browser is just a thin, dumb client. The workspace itself is actually running on a server. And that workspace has a runtime. Now, when that workspace boots up, we put a CHE agent 
inside of that workspace. And when we created a project that was a Maven project type, it said, aha, this workspace now has a Java project. It now needs Java services. And so we inject a Java agent that's running on the server inside the workspace. And then we download the JDT, which is Eclipse's uh, Java abstract and IntelliSense capabilities. And that stuff is running inside the workspace on the server next to the code. So it's running, it's running as the same speed that it would be running on your desktop. We've just located it on the, on, the, on the server. And then what our agent does is it provides a RESTful API wrapper around those JDT services, and the browser interfaces directly with that. So when the browser came up, it's actually communicating directly to my workspace to that server agent that is then communicating with the JDT services, which is giving the IntelliSense. The IntelliSense is working at the same speed as it would in any other location. It's just doing it remotely for us, and we're propagating the results back. Um, uh, and, and just to show you know, the, uh, the awesomeness of this, I hit Shift F6 twice. I can come in here and you know, refactor this. Um, and this, you know, again, all in the browser without having to install any software. Um, and uh, here I did a refactoring. It's showing me the before and after of what it will do. I'm going to hit OK. And you will see in just a second when I zoom back in that my class was renamed my class Samsung in the editor. It's been renamed in the file tree. It's also been renamed up in the top editor. And inside of it, it's been renamed here. So in the browser, without installing any software, we just performed a class level refact uh, refactoring command on that. OK, so we have this. Uh, that's all well and good. I want to typically compile it. Um, so I come in here, and our workspace, it's a runtime. So guess what? You can get a terminal into your workspaces. So I'll just open up a couple of terminals. Uh, you know, we can take a look around. I can run Midnight Commander if you really wanted to in your workspace on this. Uh, that's always fun to do. Um, and uh, I can come into the projects. And here's the same project in my terminal um, that I have there. Uh, but what I really want is I want to build it. I'm going to go ahead and launch this build. And what we have is this command structure, which basically says, hey, here's this workspace here, this workspace machine. And I'm going to run this build command against it. And off it went. And essentially what we did is we took some command and we injected it into our remote workspace that's running on that server. And it's now executing in that workspace. And in this particular case, it's maven-f against that project. It does a clean install. It then copies a WAR file, and it uh, puts it into a Tomcat directory. That command is completely editable. The one that we just ran was here. And it was a Maven command. And, and here's the syntax for that. So you can add and change these commands as you see fit. Um, and you can see that it compiled. It's great. I love that. And let's just go ahead and launch a, um, a server. So I launch another command. And you can see that uh, this is another Maven command that's actually starting Tomcat, which is that project that we have. It's going to go to town here. Uh, and in just a minute, once it gives us the all thumbs up here on the boot. Oh, it already started. There it is. It gave us a preview URL. And was it not done? What is going on here? Oh, it wasn't done. There we go. All right. And there's our application. Again, off on this, this, now this application is running in the workspace. Inside that workspace, we launched a Tomcat server. It deployed our project code inside of that. And it gave us a preview URL. And I say, hi, Tyler. And you know, hello, Tyler. And then we appended that Samsung developer conference, Dan is my friend. Right? So we launched the workspace. We didn't have to install any utilities. We got a project. We edited the code. We compiled it. We ran it. Um, and we can go further with this. We've got a debug mode here. Um, I could add a, a debug configuration. This is a Java server. Um, and it's 8,000 debug. Yep. Close this. Uh, I created my debug configuration. I actually want to select that debugger. And then I'm going to run that debugger. 
and now it's connecting to that um, uh, application. And, and here I've got my debugger. I didn't set any breakpoints, so that was a mistake there. Uh, but there I could set a breakpoint, and we could run it through again, and it will pause, let us change the variables, look at the thread stack on that. Um, so again, all distributed without installing any software. OK, so um, uh, pause there. Questions on Che? Again, before I get into the, uh, yes, wow, he rose his hand so fast. Yes. You know, if you do that at 2 in the morning and you're not too careful, you end up with a scar. <laughs> so be careful. Uh, Vim key binding, Vim and Emacs, yes. <laughs> yes. It, it's, a, it's a standard Orion editor feature. Comes with the Orion editor on that. So, um, uh, you, know, go to, you know, go to town on the editor. Um, he's not even paying attention. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, any other questions on, yes, sir, yeah. Yeah? If you're busy coding and you lose connection with the server, well, so the workspace is still running actively there. Um, and so when you reconnect again, the workspace is, is, still, is still there. What you're going to see is you're going to see it like, I'm not connected to the server. You're going to see these error messages there. But the workspace is still running. The, the bigger issue is that um, what we do is that if the, uh, we have configurations on what to do if the workspace goes idle. Now, idleness here is measured by user activity, not by, hey, I've got a command running. And so if a user goes idle, like when we run this at a cloud scale with hundreds of thousands of users concurrently, um, uh, you might launch a 20-minute compilation. But if you go away for 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes of idleness. And so in that situation, we actually snapshot the workspace and snapshot its entire state, save it as a Docker image, put it in a Docker registry, and then it's offline. The workspace is uh, uh, stored. And then when you come back online, you get um, uh, a new container off of that snapshotted image. And then the browser reconnects with that there. So there's a whole sequence of what to do when you have this idleness uh, situation. Now, when you run Che on your desktop by yourself, the default configuration is unlimited idleness. We won't do that. But you can imagine if you start running this as a server and you're starting to support multiple users concurrently, um, these things are taking up RAM. They're taking up a lot of RAM. So you know, idleness and snapshotting become really important. OK, um, Arctic IDE. So um, doo -doo 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 -doo. OK, um, I thought I had a workspace already running. I must have lost. So zoom out. Which one is which? No, this is the Arctic ID. OK, so uh, I'm just switching over to a different workspace. This workspace has the um, uh, Arctic IDE installed on top of it. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go out and show you the sequence of how I created this real quick. So if I launch back into the dashboard, if I wanted to create a new project, Um, I'm going to create a new workspace. In the ready-to-go stacks, we've got an Arctic stack that we've built. We also happen to have an Android stack. Google, Android Studio, watch out. And um, in this Arctic stack, we install Fedora 23. We have the Arctic SDK tools. We also install GDB and ADB, which is the Android debug bridge. Now, this workspace, when you go and create it, it's created in the server out in the cloud. And in this case, it's on my server here. So this workspace created. I created a C project here. Uh, very simple blink is the standard Arctic uh, hello world scenario. And inside this workspace, I have not connected any devices yet, but you'll see that there's a little happiness uh, Arctic icon here. And I'm in my workspace. Um, and you can see that I've got ADB, which is the Android debug bridge. So this is a utility that was not in my Java workspace, but it's in here. And just for fun, I can do ADB devices. And uh, it comes up. And you, way down here, you can see this uh, identity. 
And what that is is it uses ADB devices. I've got this USB cable connected to this Arctic device here, and it will use that to identify the device, right? And so I can actually use ADB, uh, Android Debug Bridge to communicate back and forth over USB. Um, uh, I can compile this code. So uh, I just run this build, and it just does a uh, ARM compilation. We have ARM utilities in here, and uh, that lack of output means that it built successfully. And uh, so I can edit, I can build, and I can run all the same sort of things that we just saw in the Java project. But it doesn't do us much good without a device. So uh, what I want to do is add a device. We're just going to come in here and add an Arctic device, and we'll call it the uh, tech session one. And because we, of uh, the discovery that we did, it's using the ADB uh, bridge, and it discovered that this device is actually connected to this network on this IP address here. So uh, we're going to grab that IP address, and we're going to then use SSH. And we've got an SSH protocol. We connect. <coughs> what was that? Yeah, it's the space issue. Oh, live bug. There we go. Yeah. All right. Ah. OK. But uh, you see that we added a device down here. And now, by the way, we can add some more sessions. And now what we've got is a terminal on the device. So what we do is we did a CHE machine, uh, a workspace machine for this device. When we get a valid SSH connection, we do a couple of things. The first thing we do is we install our own, uh, not our proprietary, but our own web terminal onto the device. And it runs as a server on port, I think, like 4411 or something like that. And we open it up to this particular browser so that the browser now on this particular device, when he opens up a terminal, we get this bash shell. So um, oh, there's no midnight commander installed. Emacs is not installed. Um, but uh, things are installed, and, um, and I'm actually on the device itself uh, here. Uh, I'm going to remove um, uh, the blink, because I've used this device before. Uh, but the next thing you can do is, once you have your projects, which are in your workspace, I need to get it onto the device. Uh, so I can come over here, push the device, and it sees that it's the device that's there. Uh, I can push it. It's pushing the device. It gives me the happy green, green light. And if I do an ls-al, there's the blink. And Elmo me. Elmo me. Thank you. Did I get the right? Was it Lucy? All right, yeah. Pulp Fiction. Uh, I can run the blink. And I'm running it on the device, and off it goes here. So from within my IDE on this laptop, I'm able to both work in my local workspace here, connect to the device, uh, compile locally, push those binaries onto the device, and then run it here. And there's off blinking here on that. Um, we can do debugging on this as well. And the debugger can either be local to your application in the workspace, or the debugger can run on this device. The way we do it is we actually install a GDB server on the device, which supports debugging for ADA, Python, uh, C, C++, Java. You can do a different kind of Java there, Go, if that's your sort of thing. And you run the GDB server with your binary on the device. And then the debugger from uh, the workspace will connect and give you debugging capabilities as well. Uh, the one thing we wanted to do that we haven't gotten to yet uh, uh, Non Elmo me, Su Susie, um, Charlotte. There we go, thank you. All right. Um, the one thing that we want to do is if you notice, I had to push the binary onto the device. Um, in the next version of what we'll do is we want to create a very web webby like development experience. Uh, since we can take over the device and install our own software onto it, we're going to install an rsync client onto it as well, and we will auto rsync the entire project structure from here, from your workspace onto the device. So as you're building and modifying files, they're automatically pushed onto the device. So all you have to do is decide whether you want to run it or not. And we can auto set up the debugger as well. Um, so what that then happens is that you can edit, save, run, edit, save, run, edit, save, run, without having to worry about sync, push, sync, push on that. Great. Um, so. Will you uh, switch me back over to this primary machine here? Thank you. Yes. Uh, how do you get started with this? We'd love it first if you were all hanging out on your computers to go GitHub star us. This is an open source project. 
The clip's public license. You can definitely participate in the project, but give us all the stars. Um, it's hosted at eclipse.org slash che slash arctic. Or you can just go to eclipse.org slash che. We'll get you to the right place. Uh, we give you a, um, uh, uh, basically a vagrant file. To install it, you get a vagrant file. And you just do vagrant up. And what we do um, as a server mode, whether it's out in the cloud or, or local, we actually set up a VM. And inside that VM, we run a Java server, which is Che. We install the Arctic uh, runtime. We install uh, all the Arctic plugins that you need. And you'll get it on that IP address, uh, 28.28.8080. And it's just ready to go. Um, you'll need a board. You'll need. Uh, the discovery of the IP address only works over USB, but uh, otherwise, if the board is connected over Ethernet or Wi-Fi, the SSH will work uh, uh, permanently on that. So what we do in our office, where we have three or four boards hooked up, uh, we've got them with static IP addresses. We've given them host names, and they're all on wireless. So once we've got them set up, we don't need the discover anymore. Our engineers have them all programmed in, and they just go to town on that there. Excellent. Uh, so we have like five minutes left. Thank you so much. Uh, Q&A, uh, they've asked us to do the questions if we can into the microphone so that it's recorded for others. But um, if not, thank you so much. This is awesome. This was a great project. Thank you, Dan and Wei, for championing that. Uh, we really enjoyed building this, and we have a lot of ideas of what we're going to do for the future on it. But questions? Oh, thank you. Really love the work. Uh, what about dependencies? Like, for instance, if I needed to apt get something in my Ubuntu, like, is there any way of? Yeah. So uh, his question is about the dependencies. Um, uh, the since their Docker, your workspace is powered by Docker containers. Uh, they're all from some base Linux image, which could be Ubuntu. Uh, like our standard ones are Ubuntu. Uh, the one that we did here is Fedora. Uh, and so if it's Fedora, you do the DNF, which is their package installer. On Ubuntu, it's, uh, I think we use Yum. Uh, and you just uh, run that right in here because you have root access to it. Now, uh, when we create your workspace, uh, the projects get added in dynamically. Anything else that you install, like uh, packages, and that, that changes the state of the workspace itself. So in order to maintain that state, if you shut down the workspace, you need to snapshot it. If you just shut it down, that internal state's going to be lost. But if you snapshot it, we'll then rehydrate it when you start that workspace again, and it maintains it. And how does it actually get to the device? Like when you like did the push to device? Yeah. Is that when the dependency gets on the device? Um, so the depend so uh, when you do dependencies, it's all in your local workspace, and all those dependencies become part of your project tree, okay? Um, and that's slash projects, and you can have multiple projects there mapped to different repositories, um, and then you push your projects, either folders or files or the entire project, onto the device, and it drags it along with it. So, so you as a developer then have a choice. Do you want all those dependencies in your workspace that we then sync? Or do you have them pre-installed onto an image of the device so that your applications will run when they get onto that? Great. Last one. Um, can you just mention something about the web, like the uh, REST API to Che? Can you yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the REST API to Che. So uh, there, the, it's REST. <laughs> uh, we have... Um, uh, we have, uh, why, why am I blanking on it? Thank you, thank you, Brad. Swagger uh, is actually, Swagger configurations are stored on both the server and the workspaces themselves. So uh, I don't know if you can switch back to um, uh, uh, Charlotte, thank you, Austin. Um, yeah. If I just come here, I think if I just do Swagger on this, that's, there we go, yeah. Um, so on the same, I just take the same URL, and I just hit uh, slash swagger on it. It actually loads all the APIs that are on this Chase server, and you can interface with them right here and there. So the, the, um, the, the user dashboard and the IDE are just clients that are using these RESTful interfaces. Now, this is the server itself. The actual workspace, each workspace gets a unique identifier. And so each workspace has a custom set of RESTful APIs that changes. 
uh, because what happens is, based upon the projects that get loaded in, each project has a type, and that type dictates different plugins that get installed, which change the RESTful APIs. So um, in our docs, we tell you um, how to get your workspace ID, and then you can do that workspace ID with another Swagger annotation, and it will go and get the RESTful APIs for that workspace, and you can programmatize it. The, the purpose of the Chase server is crudding. Create, read, update, destroy workspaces. The workspace is where you actually do the work. So it's projects, project management, project typing, IntelliSense, all that sort of work there. Um, this Che project, by the way, uh, SAP uh, runs Che inside of all their products now. So all their new products, like the HANA Cloud, they run the Che server, and they have built their own web IDE um, that uses our RESTful APIs. And so it's actually really gorgeous, and it focuses on uh, database-driven applications. Um, Red Hat built an OpenShift IDE off of this. Um, uh, who else? Uh, there's other projects of the same sort of substance of Samsung that are coming that I can't talk about yet, but uh, it's intended to be highly extensible. Yeah, I know it's awkward to get come up and, you know, stay, yeah. And re related to that uh, REST API, um, uh, for example, if I want to make sure that my uh, uh, project uh, compiles on a different stack. Yes. Is there a way to use that REST API to automate kind of this process? So you're thinking about, I, I have a project and they need to cross compile it for different architectures or something like that. Um, uh, are, there's, you could in theory use our API to do that because you, you know, our API will launch a workspace which is a Docker container and then you can invoke commands inside of that. So you could have workspaces of different architecture or uh, with different tools for cross-compilation and then you could invoke it. Um, we're not really a CI system. So, so it's, it's not really intended to say, here's a job and I want to run this job under 40 different configurations, iterate through. Project so files live inside that container, right? The, 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 the files, the project files are mounted in. So the project files are actually in two locations. So in Che, there's long-term storage, which is outside the workspace itself that they are. And then when the workspace is started, they're mounted in. Now, on a desktop, that effectively means it's just a soft link. But in a distributed system, it's actually, they're located in separate locations. And we have an rsync protocol that keeps them in sync. So as the developer's working in his remote workspace off in the cloud, it synchronizes it to long-term storage for protection as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, if that's not it, this was the end of the session. I hope you guys all had a great conference. I know we did. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to hang around for like the next 15 minutes and hang out, answer any questions, um, help you get started with it if you'd like. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>